So if you obviously start the chronograph and you immediately stop it at like 10 seconds, that means that you are doing, what, 350 kilometers an hour. You are a big Speedmaster fan, collector. I would love to be a Daytona fan, but... <laughs> Sometimes they do not run as smooth as the in-house chronograph movements. It doesn't matter if it's a Seiko or if it's a Speedmaster on a Daytona. Whatever you can afford and you love, just go for it. Hey guys, we are back to talk about watches today with the first review video of the year. Balash and me, Pascal, we want to talk about chronograph watches today because chronograph watches are actually the second most popular, or chronographs are the second most popular um, complication on Chrono24 when it comes to sales, right after the date complication, if you consider that a complication. And yeah, that's why we want to focus on five um, iconic pieces today. Right, we have five, five watches here. IW Flieger, IWC Flieger, Hoya Monaco, Breitling Navy Timer, Rolex Daytona, and last but not least, the Omega Speedmaster Professional, which has a very special significance today because we are shooting this video on a Tuesday, so it's Speedy Tuesday, and that's why we are also wearing the Speedmaster, both Pascal and I. Right, so I would say we have to start the chronograph. And the video. Yes. There's always a discussion on um, how useful mechanical watches are today, but I don't want to get into this discussion now. Um, but same goes for chronographs. Sure. I mean, today you have a stopwatch in every smartphone or smartwatch, mm -hmm. um, or Alexa tells you the time when your pizza is ready, and every um, car when you're driving is able to tell you how fast you're going. So Absolutely. a chronograph is not or does not have this practical use. And I think when, when we talk about cars uh, being advanced and planes are even more advanced than yeah. pilots. So I guess people might not like this, but I think it's a bit of an obsolete uh, complication. But anyways, in back in the ways. days, it was definitely um, a groundbreaking Absolutely. innovation. Mm -hmm. um, when in 1816, I think, uh, Louis Monet, well, it is said that Louis Monet was the first who invented the chronograph. Obviously, it was not a wristwatch. It was more like a huge, yeah, huge um, pocket watch kind of pocket like watch device, thing. Yeah. Um, but it is said that it's um, it was the first chronograph. Yeah. Um, but there's a bit uh, confusion going on here. Yeah, I think uh, for the longest time people said that um, it was actually 1821 uh, when Nikola Ryosek invented the first chronograph, and I think. To a certain degree, that is actually true. And even though you're right, uh, Louis Monet was the was the first one in uh, 1816 to invent something like that. But strictly speaking, that's not a chronograph. Uh, Louis Monet didn't call it a chronograph. And if we analyze the word chronograph, that it means time writer. And there's another word that some brands often use, and especially Junkans, for example, which is a chronoscope, which means time shower. Now, going back to 1821 and Nicola Riosek, um, his device is also was in a big box. It would measure the time by um, putting a, a line on a disc that would rotate around. So that was actually writing the time. Um, hence, it was called a chronograph. Whereas these devices, they don't write the time, they just show you the time. Hence, they are supposed to be called chronoscope. For some reason, obviously, um, we went with the word chronograph. Your hands. Yeah, and Junkans is, I, I'm not sure if uh, of any other brands, but I'm definitely sure that Junkans uses the word chronoscope. And if we want to go really down into detail, then chronoscope is the word we should use because these devices only show the time, unless somebody has a wristwatch where uh, the time is actually registered on a piece of paper, then that would be um, officially a chronograph. But, um, but having said that, yes, Louis Monet in 1816 and then Nicola Riosek in uh, 1921 were the the first two to, to develop something like that. So, but as we said, these inventions or these um, mechanical tools mm -hmm. um, did not look like, like these watches at all. These have been around since, I think, uh, the 20th century. Longines and uh, Breitling mm -hmm. are the, the names here who invented the first or came up with the first um, chronograph wristwatch. And later on, there was this famous race to the first automatic chronograph wristwatch. Yeah. And 19... 69, 69. Is, is the, yeah. the So 1969 is the year when they came out. Obviously, this project started earlier. And, and basically, just to, to sum things up, we had um, 
three key players. We had Zenith, um, we had um, Project 99, which involves um, Hoyer at the time, Hamilton Buren, uh, Breitling, and Dubois de Pra. So they all formed this Project 99 uh, group. And then we have Cycle. There's, no, there's not one winner, there are three winners, each of them um, for separate reasons. Um, dates are a bit um, interesting, who presented the first prototype, then who put the first watch into production, and so on and so forth. Depending how you see the race, that's not Exactly. If you, if you fancy Zenith, then you say Zenith was the first one. If you fancy Project 99 brands, like, as I said, Hamilton, Breitling or uh, Hoyer, then you say they were the first one. And if you were a, a Seiko fan, then you would say Seiko was the first one with the 6139. Um, I think it doesn't really, really matter at the end of the day. What matters is that um, they all came out with their own movements and obviously um, amazing models. And these movements were built into. And because of that, we just had a huge selection of, of um, awesome watches from Zenith, from Breitling, from Hamilton, from Hoyer, Seiko and beyond. Um, obviously, other brands also took over um, these movements. So, um, and it's important that it was successful. So they made it super so successful. All right. three of them. Exactly. Exactly. So now let's move on with the question: What is a chronograph? We know that it's a, a usual watch or wristwatch, but it has this additional function of a stopwatch. Right. Um, but how does it, like, how does it work? As as you said, it's actually a stopwatch. Um, you have a normal time-only watch, and then you have the added um, function of, of the chronograph. Obviously, you can also have added function of dates and moon phases and triple calendars and, and so on and so forth. But um, a chronograph function is basically a time measuring function. You operate the chronograph by the pushers. Usually, there's at least one pusher. Um, it can be a mono pusher, um, which is either on the case or integrated into the crown. In some cases, it's integrated into the crown. So with the mono pusher, you start, you stop, and then you reset the chronograph. With the same pusher, right? With the same pusher, right? With the same one pusher. Um, normally, and of course here we have um, watches with two pushers. So with the top pusher, you start the chronograph, you stop it, and with the bottom pusher, you reset it. And then of course, again, you have chronographs that are split seconds where you can measure um, two different um, elapsed times uh, in one watch. But what you have in a chronograph is at least one or two subdials, but mostly three subdials. Um, and then those subdials will measure the, um, the elapsed time in 30 minutes, um, 12 hours, and also in seconds. For example, in the Breitling, we have a 30 minute counter at the three o'clock, we have a 12 uh, hour counter at the six o'clock, and then the continuous seconds hand is at the nine, which shows you the seconds of the, the time only function of the watch. And then the seconds of the chronograph is obviously the large uh, chronograph hand in the middle. And basically you start the chronograph and it starts to measure. And after every minute, the subdial will register it. And after every hour, the subdial will register that. And basically that's the function. And of course you have different bezels. Um, like the tachymeter bezel. Like the tachymeter bezel on the Speedmaster. Three or also, out of five have it, right? So the Breitling has it, the Daytona has it. Right, the Breitling the also has the... Yeah, so the Breitling also has the slide rule, which is a bit more complicated and we don't want to get into the details, but it's, um, it's a useful tool for pilots to measure speed, but as well as distance. And, and you can and, rotate the bezel. Yeah, you can rotate the bezel. A tachymeter, I think, is the most common um, bezel variant on a chronograph. Or, for example, with the Monaco or with the Fliege, there are uh, no bezels other than just a 60-second counter um, around the dial. Basically, a tachymeter is... Um, to measure like speed or distance? Right. right. So to, to measure speed at a given or a unit of distance. So if you travel, let's say, um, exactly a kilometer, you start it in the beginning, and then after the one kilometer, you stop it, and where the chronograph hands shows on the tachymeter bezel, let's say 100, you do 100 kilometers per hour. Right. So if you obviously start the chronograph and you immediately stop it at like 10 seconds, that means that you are doing, what, 350 kilometers an hour. Yeah, if you're far away. Yeah, or in a spaceship for a Speedmaster. Then you have other bezels like a telemeter bezel. Which, uh, which measures the distance. Um, this is also something that they used to call the artillery um, bezel back in the day. And this, 
the idea is pretty simple. I think it's everybody knows this from their childhood when they, you know, your parents used to tell you when there's a storm and you um, you hear the the, the boom. Um, you start counting and then you see the flash and then if you count it to three, that means that the storm is three kilometers away. The telemeter is basically the same thing. In artillery, people would hear the bang of the cannons, they would start the chronographs and then they would see the impact, they would stop it and then they would know how far the, the enemy or the, 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 the cannons or whatever of the enemy is located. And then we have the pulsation bezel, which people use in the medical field, where they would measure the pulse of a patient uh, by the beats, there's like a 30 or a 60 pulsation uh, bezel, which means they would count to 30 beats of their pulse and then they stop the chronograph and the number where the, the chronograph hand would stand would give them the pulsation of the patient. But that's not really too often that you see such a bezel. Usually you would even have a tachymeter mm. or a, even a telemeter bezel. So, but what is special about the movement, so the inside of a chronograph watch? So chronograph movements obviously can be uh, automatic or they can be um, manual wind, they can be quartz or whatever. Um, these are, I think, other than the Speedmaster, all of them are automatic movements. Which is also, by the way, on our platform where 80% of mm. chronographs um, sold are automatic. automatic. Right? Yeah, I mean, these days is, it's, um, it's something that watch, make, uh, watch brands usually do to, to produce automatic movement watches. It's very convenient and then in case of the chronograph, it's, it maybe makes the chronograph movement a bit thicker. But basically, you have chronograph movements where there's a time-only separate movement and the chronograph module is built onto it. Or you also have chronograph movements which are designed from the ground up to be um, chronograph movements. And these mechanical movements are um, have obviously all the features uh, built in with the time I'm showing function. The, the Speedmaster 1861 is, is such a movement. Is there a difference between an in-house built chronograph movement and a, a, a movement with a module on top? Obviously an in-house developed chronograph movement would also would always be more valued or, or highly valued because of the fact that everything was developed in-house, whereas a chronograph module is something that you can buy. And if you have a, a movement, maybe that's an in-house time-only movement, base movement, you can put it to it and then create a chronograph. Um, these movements are usually thicker, um, maybe not as highly regarded in... Yeah, in movements, for example. For example, uh, as, as, a, as an in-house chronograph movement, that's obviously... Um, the top of the line and there are a lot of uh, manufacturers that created great movements back in the day like the Valjoux 72 or um, the Le Mania uh, 27 Crow which eventually became the Omega 321 and then the 861 and then that became the 1861 um, but Excelsior Park or Venus they also created great movements and those were not in-house unless uh, the watch was branded as Le Mania or um, for example Angelus created the 215 movement which is a pretty legendary movement. It went into the first uh, Mare Nostrums that were used by, um, um, by the in the first Panerai watches. Um, so there's plenty. And I, I think, as far as I'm concerned, those are um, better or more valuable or um, more interesting in terms of watchmaking history. Um, but a watch with a, with a chronograph module, um, or a chronograph watch with a chronograph module, Mm. It's also just as great. Okay, because I heard that sometimes they do not run as smooth as the in-house chronograph movements. I mean, the whole thing is not designed together, mm. right? You have a base movement and you have a, a chronograph module on top of it. It's not the same as building or designing a movement with a chronograph function from the ground up. Mm. That is obviously much different and much more intricate, hence probably smoother and uh, more resistant. But so all of this um, made me wonder if one could see the traffic changing um, on Chrono 24 about, about chronographs or, or maybe people were looking into watches more and I think you, you prepared some data on that. Yes, indeed, I did. So if you could maybe bring that up and, of and course. tell us a few interesting facts. I mean, there was a huge buzz around chronographs last sure. year um, because of these events and anniversaries. And we had a look uh, into our marketplace data um, to figure out um, how popular chronographs um, are in terms of like um, demand or sales on mm -hmm. Chrono24 um, and indeed we could find out that um, as I said the chronograph complication is the second most popular complication 
after the date function and that um, people look for that people interested. look for mm -hmm. um, and actually buy and actually buy mm -hmm. um, but interesting is um, the ranking so the numbers of sales in the category complication what are the um, most popular models and um, I can tell that we have some of them here um, I the can cheat and look at your stats but and don't I will don't, not Steve. please don't cheat I saw the first one the first one is uh, on first, first place is the speedmaster um, then comes the Daytona, mm -hmm. um, actually the um, the white dial Daytona, not the black dial, which was so exactly this one, like but the exactly new one. this one, and exactly this reference, the eleven sixty five twenty. Okay. Um, and it was the Daytona in two thousand eighteen. Mm -hmm. It was in um, fourth place, mm -hmm. and now it's <coughs> on second second place. Um, and then comes the Navitimer, and then we have the Carrera, which we don't have. So the today. Navy time is on the third place? On the third place. Okay, so yeah. one, two, three. Yeah, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. um, and then comes the Breitling Chronomat, another Breitling. Mm -hmm. um, the EVC, IWC, sorry, for mm -hmm. German. Yeah. IWC Flieger is on uh, seventh place. Okay, so let me... And uh, Monaco on uh, ninth place. Okay. So, so we, fun. with these five watches, we cover Yeah, it's quite, not a bad lineup. Yeah, not a bad lineup. Interesting. So now you know how popular these uh, models are in terms of sales uh, at least. So we should introduce them yeah. to you, I guess, um, a bit more in detail. Or have a closer look. Or have right. a closer look on them. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with the uh, IWC Flieger. Right, so this was number seventh, I think, on your list. The interesting thing about the IWC Flieger is obviously that there is no vintage version, not as vintage or not as old as, as obviously a Monaco or a Breitling or any of the other models. IWC did not make such chronographs back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So this is a fairly new watch, but that doesn't take anything away from its uh, value. Uh, I think this is um, a very popular watch among uh, a lot of people, and especially about IWC collectors. They, they really um, go for the Flieger. Obviously, the design is, is coming from um, the vintage military uh, IWCs. And of course, if you compare it to the Mark 18, which we did a Zoom video on, some of you might have seen it, then you can see that the, the lineage of the DNA of the Mark 18 is also here. So although it's a military looking chronograph, it's not a vintage chronograph, but it's a great watch, it has a great size. Vintage inspired design. Vintage inspired, I would say, yes. And um, yeah, and it's just a fun watch to have. Um, regarding price, I think you know that better. What's the, what's the value on it? You can get these with a bracelet um, for around four to five K. Of course, prices um, differ um, depending, depending on the condition right. and bracelet box or strap, and box and papers, yeah. but around four to five K, mm -hmm. you can find some nice ones. Yeah. But it's a cool watch and um, I think the size is perfect even with someone with a, a smaller wrist. You know, the hands, the sword hands, the triangle at 12 o'clock, they all add to the, to the military-esque feeling. And um, yeah, it's just a great watch. And uh, if you're into IWC or if you want a, a simple chronograph, then um, that's not a bad watch to choose. I think the, the size is really great. Mm -hmm. This end, the bracelet is nice. Yeah. The small links, very mm. comfy. Then moving on from the IWC, we have the Monaco um, and we have the Breitling. I think we should not really get into the details because we kind of covered them in um, when we talked about the history and we also covered them in our Zoom episode. So if any of you have not seen them, then you can check them out and you have more detailed information about both the Monaco and the Breitling. But then there's one thing that you wanted to mention, or you yes. pointed me out regarding these, actually these three watches. Special about these three watches is that they have, a, or they come with a date. Right. Um, because usually a chronograph, or you don't have too many chronograph watches um, with, a, with a date feature day, back right? in the days. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Flieger even has a day date. A day date, function, yeah. Which right. I, I think is um, special to this watch. So. I thought I'd mention it. If you have a chronograph feature, a day date, and it's automatic, then it's uh, as, um, as convenient as it gets, um, absolutely. And those two, as you said, uh, have a date at the six, and then the Breitling has a date at the, well, at the four o'clock, uh, five o'clock position okay. as well. So let's move on to the Daytona. Exactly. Let's have a look at it. Um, maybe the most hyped and definitely the most expensive uh, watch we have here on the table, um, selling for around 15 to 20k on chrono at the moment. Um, this one is the 116520, so the last reference before the update um, for the ceramic battle. Mm -hmm. And we have the white dial with the movement uh, 4130. And the uh, Daytona, as you might know, 
Um, the name comes from the famous Daytona Speedway in Florida. And um, along with the name goes the connection to, to, to racing. To car racing, yeah. right. Um, but I mean, it's clearly a, a race car driver's watch, or at least it was. Now it's more of a, uh, I guess, a banker's watch or a, <laughs> or a very successful businessman's watch. But back in the day, it was, um, it was designed to serve the purpose of a, of a race car driver. Sure, it has the, the same uh, tachymeter bezel to measure speed. Up to 400 kilometers yeah, per hour. Yeah, up to 400. I mean, which should be enough to for your yeah. drive to the office in the morning. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't think any race car driver <laughs> in the '60s did did 400. But yeah, but so the, the bezel is um, is obviously a um, a clear indication of that. But this is a this is a very cool, very sturdy, nice looking sports watch. The fact that it's a bit hyped, as you said, or well, very hyped. Um, that's a different story. I think some people love it, some people don't. And it has a um, nice oyster case, 39 milli uh, 40 millimeters, mm -hmm. um, which is a great size, I think. It's a cool size, yeah. It's not too big, it's not too small. It's, even if you have a bigger wrist, it kind of looks good. If you have a small wrist, it still works. It's, it's not too gigantic on you. I think it's a, it's a great size. Um, yeah, it looks good. I mean, I don't know if you're a... I guess you're a Daytona fan, but... I like the Daytona yeah. and the white dial better than the black dial. But you're not a Chronograph fan so no, much. No, I'm not a Chronograph fan too much, but I like the the design of the Daytona. And what's also interesting about um, the Daytona is um, that there's the Zenith Daytona out there, yeah. which means that um, Rolex um, used to use Zenith movement right. for the Daytonas for, I think, 12, 12 years. I mean, before they used the Volju uh, 72, so the vintage Daytonas have also had a, a non-in-house movement with the Volju 72, and then the, the Zenith movement Daytonas again had a a movement which was not in-house Rolex in-house movement um, and those are um, pretty expensive these days it's a very collective the Zenith movement Daytonas and you can spot them by the the sub dial I think because the um, second uh, sub dial was um, at nine o'clock position and here it's at six o'clock mm -hmm. position so that's the way how to spot the Zenith but then Daytona. there's there's another difference between all the other watches and the Zenith, uh, sorry, and the Daytona, right? And that's the, and those are the pushers, screw down pushers. First, you have to unlock them before you press. So that's special about the Daytona. Yeah, I guess it's uh, it protects the watch or the chronograph to be to be started or actually stopped um, by uh, banging it against something inside the car or I don't know why you're putting your gear on. So unless the chronograph is a chronograph pusher is unlocked, you cannot uh, operate the chronograph. Let's finally get to the um, number one mm -hmm. in terms of sales on Chrono 24, the Omega Speedmaster. Um, and you are a big Speedmaster fan, collector. I would love to be a Daytona fan, but <laughs> being a Speedmaster fan is um, something that's, it's a choice, I guess. It's not the choice of your wallet, it's the choice of your heart. And uh, indeed, I love all of these watches, but um, the Speedmaster is something that's the closest to me. We know that it was, um, released in 1957 uh, by Omega uh, together with the Seamaster uh, 300 and together with the Rainmaster at the time and with these three watches they wanted to um, tackle um, three different areas, sea or like diving with the Seamaster, car racing with the Speedmaster and then the Rainmaster um, engineers and people working in, um, in environments when high magnetism was um, affecting them. Of course the Speedmaster very soon became um, um, absolutely not involved with car racing, but involved with space race or space racing. That was the 60s when the Americans and the Russians were racing uh, who will get to space first and who will get to the moon first. Uh, we know the story about NASA, how um, NASA requested 10 brands um, to test their watches and out of the 10 only four um, replied and out of the four Speedmaster was the one that actually passed all the tests tests and then became NASA uh, qualified and then you can also see it in the back when it says flight qualified by NASA for all manned space missions and then the story after that is legendary obviously the first Speedmaster came with a uh, with a 321 movement which was a Lemania based movement based on the 27 Crow um, which was also used by Omega before and then the 321 was upgraded uh, around 1968-69 to the 861 um, and then the 861 later on was 1861, which is in this one. Still hand wound. Still hand wound. The watch, I mean, this watch is from uh, 2018. This watch is from 1968. And if you put them next to each other, pretty similar. 
I think it's also a very versatile watch uh, in Definitely. many ways. You can wear it with a strap, you can wear it with a bracelet. You can, yeah, I mean, if you have a Speedy Tuesday 1, which was a limited edition, but it's, it's um, the DNA is still the same. I have it for my friend, <laughs> which is you. Because <laughs> I don't own a Speedmaster, but... Yeah. Yet. Yet. Yes. Yeah, so um, I think the Speedmaster is, is a great watch for, for, for many reasons, being versatile, just as the Daytona is. A bit and bigger. A bit bigger, 42 it's 42 millimeters. millimeters, right? It's also steel case. Uh, as you said, it's a, it's a mechanical um, manual wind movement, so it's not, not automatic uh, like all the other ones. But it's a legendary watch, um, just like the other four time And it really pieces. served a, a purpose. I think that's yes. also special about the speed buzzer because they had to um, measure the um, remaining engine. Yeah, I mean, they used it, you used it a lot. Get back to Earth, for example. Absolutely. I mean, um, this is a proper tool watch, just like a Daytona was a tool watch back in its time, and the, the Brighting Navy Timer, absolutely for pilots. These are all wonderful watches for, for various reasons. And I think if you have one in your collection, better yet, all five, you are, uh, you're, you're pretty good, you're set. So I prepared something uh, special and uh, ho hopefully fun for you, Balash. Okay. Uh, as a chronograph lover, collector and expert. Um, That's I very kind of you, Pascal. Yeah, thank you. Um, sometimes I'm kind. So I prepared some um, quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, I will start my chronograph and you have one minute to answer these questions. So really a quick shot for every question. Okay, but your chronograph is running already. From the beginning That's of the video. That's a good point. I will okay. stop it and So I leave start mine again, running and then and you, you can leave stop it your... running. Okay. Okay. And I shouldn't look at the screen. No, we are set, yeah. And he d really does not know the questions. We did not discuss that. No, I don't know. Before. So I knew about the game. Full disclosure. Yeah. I knew about the game, but I didn't know about the questions. So Okay. Alright. So ready? Yes. Let's go. Um, what is the reason for you to wear a chronograph? Uh, I like the the, the the mechanism, I like the technicality, I like that it does something um, and I find it useful. I think I use it pretty often um, to measure certain things. I, I uh, use my chronograph before I use the, the uh, stopwatch function on my phone. Okay, cool. What about chronograph watches and the suit? Um, I think uh, chronograph watches can and should be worn with a suit. Um, I don't like them on a bracelet, I like them on a leather strap. Um, brown shoes, brown belt, brown leather strap, um, but I think it's absolutely no problem. Of course, there are some some um, the watches you shouldn't wear. But okay, do you swim with it? Not with the suit, but with no. the watch. Okay, <laughs> no suit, no, no suit, no watch. <laughs> are they more fragile than um, time-only watches? I don't think so. They're more complicated. Maybe they are, but uh, I've never experienced it. Okay, what about uh, um, using a chronograph underwater? Um, some brands offer such chronographs, recently introduced. Um, I would not see the purpose of because it. Because there's this uh, myth, myth that you don't sure. should not start a chronograph. Anymore. Sure. Um, would you go for in-house only or as a module? I don't mind. Okay, you don't mind. What is your favorite chronograph watch? I think it's the Speedmaster, the Omega Speedmaster. Which one? Um, the vintage one, 1960, 68, 67. Okay. Do you think everyone should have a chronograph in his or her collection? I would say yes. Okay. Or as a, a diver more practical? I think you should have a diver and you should have a chronograph. Okay, good answer. Um, is there anything a buyer should be um, aware of when buying his or her first chronograph? Buy the watch that you like and that you can afford whatever chronograph that is. It doesn't matter if it's a Seiko or if it's a Speedmaster or a Daytona. Whatever you can afford and you love, just go for it. Okay. What chronograph would you recommend for a beginner? I would say um, in a cheaper um, segment, probably a Junkans, um, which is around 2K-ish. Um, if we talk about vintage, then I would say um, that there, there are more options. Um, uh, 321 Speedmaster, an Excelsior Park movement, Angelus 215, or a Volju 72 movement uh, chronograph. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, let's check the time. It was a bit longer than a minute, uh, I guess. A bit longer, <laughs> okay. but it's okay. Well. So, Pascal, I think uh, I'm stopping the chronograph now because it seems to me that that's the end of the video. Um, and I really had a great time. How about you? Me too. And I hope you had a great time too. And now you know a little bit more about chronographs and maybe you can decide whether or not buying, buying one. Mm -hmm. 
And I think what's left for us to say is make sure you subscribe to our channel, ring the bell, um, give us a thumbs up and let us know in the comments below what you think about the video, what videos you want to see next time. And this guy will answer to your comments, guaranteed. Happy to chat with you. Other than that, enjoy your watches. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Goodbye.